Mr. President, Mr. President, how are you going to get the Southern Democrats to support your civil rights legislation? I believe that civil rights is a uh, moral issue and uh, certainly hope that our uh, friends in the uh, South will adopt that view. Sir, what about Vietnam? Are you considering a troop withdrawal? I, uh, I'm committed to stopping the communists, but uh, the war is in the hands of the Vietnamese. They're going to have to win or lose that for themselves. Thank you. There's no timeline there. What happens if what? the legislation stays stuck in the President. Senate? Is this still a war we can win? Sir? When you look at the checklist of all the themes you look for when you start a drama, it, again, this is like a 10 out of 10 checklist. Ambition, jealousy, betrayal, tragedy. The list goes on, and you'll find it in the Kennedy family. I mean, that's what is so unique about the family and about this opportunity to do this show. There's so many stories about the Kennedys. There, there are, first of all, so many Kennedys to deal with. We've selected, you know, the four or five that we're concentrating on. But at first, when you say eight hours, that, that's a lot. We'll be able to cover a, a lot of material in eight hours. You realize eight hours is really just the tip of the iceberg. There's just so much that you really have to start to think about, you know, where you want the story to sit. Ultimately, the balance was to give an audience the sense of history that was happening in this fairly limited wedge of time and let them appreciate that existing in those sorts of corridors of power where huge historic decisions are made by people who also have private lives and fathers and wives and children and it's an overwhelming enough prospect to try and balance family. But when you throw it on this kind of historic stage, it's, um, it's amazing. Some of the incredible things that Jack and Bobby were dealing with at the time, then you forget that, yeah, they had to get up in the morning and put their pants on one leg at a time, and they had to deal with family matters that you just, uh, you wouldn't necessarily think that that a president would have to be dealing with while he's also trying to uh, contain nuclear war. And I was really grateful that, uh, that Joel Cernow and John Kassar really wanted to go in a different direction with this piece. I felt like that's what set us apart. This is not just a, another dry political drama about the Kennedys. When I sat down with the producers and the writers, um, they said, you know, this is more of telling a Greek tragedy and, um, you know, really just playing it as a drama like that because that's really what it was. And so we, we are filling in drama in between moments that we do know happened and we don't know really what happened behind the closed doors, but we are trying to just tell something that has good tension and a good story. People talk about the curse that seems to echo down the generations of the Kennedys, and in a certain sense, it's true. And if you're gonna see it in a kind of Greek tragedy sense, there isn't uh, a better sort of uh, patriarchal figure than Joe Kennedy. It's the Harvard and Yale guys you're talking to, the PhDs, their only allegiance is to their resume. Bobby's as smart as any of them, and he'll jump under a train for you. I'll think about it. No, don't think. Get it done. There's lots of other work to do. You don't quite see it, but it's hinted at, I think, in our story that both Jack and Bobby, they were bullied as children. The sort of modern, you know, touchy-feely, caring, sharing parenthood was something rather distant from Rose's and Joe's kind of sense of what parents should be. They were the boss. Whatever they said, you did. And if you didn't do it, you got punished. One of the reasons why I chose to run in this uh, campaign uh, to begin with, um, having won the uh, war, we must now win the peace. John F. Kennedy was a congressman who describes himself as very wooden and awkward uh, in front of a camera. And that exists. There's no question this was not the guy who grew into the presidency. The guy who grew into the presidency had great confidence and a great ability to communicate to not only a large room full of people, but to the television. Gentlemen. Sorry I'm late. Excuse me. What? What for? You're a war hero. Look like one. Oh, 
We wanted the first couple of episodes to show that Jack was not a natural born campaigner. He wanted to be a professor. He wanted to be a writer. He did what he did for his, because that's what his father wanted. He came to embrace it. He came to realize how significant a role he could play, but that took some time. Uh, they'll tell you they want less jobs. Um, they want more jobs. Greg has just inhabited JFK. He's become JFK in the way he looks, in the way he speaks, in his mannerisms. And uh, it's just very exciting for me to, to watch him uh, sort of become him every day. You know, not all of us are actually handed the opportunity to play the guy. So once you start digging in and once you start examining who he is and kind of what he is, the story becomes deeper and richer and more interesting. The sense that maybe he gave the country, the sense of purpose and the sense of enthusiasm he was able to incite was, I think, much needed at that time. It's an overwhelming task in the sense that me, just like everybody else, has a very clear sort of uh, indoctrined idea of who he was and what his presence was. It is my interpretation, as best I can, of, of trying to find something that feels honest and feels truthful. The key fact that I needed to learn about was how much pain he was in at all times in terms of his, his lower back injuries and his Addison's disease and, and a number of illnesses that he was plagued by his whole life. Our intention was, of course, to uh, help the Cuban people free themselves from the communist yoke. I listened to more Jack Kennedy than you can possibly imagine and tried to, without emulating him and without doing an impression of him, just instill something that felt authentic. When this project came up, I was so excited and I already admired her. But um, the more I just learned of her, I just, my admiration grew and I, I feel so honored to be playing her and, and she just was so creative. As women who have children know, those first couple of months are just sort of like, you don't even know what's going on and to think that she was in the White House as the first lady with a tiny infant, it's just, it's really remarkable. Katie, of course, is just interesting because her life so parallels Jackie's. So she's able to sort of pull some of that in, into this role. You know, she's a working mother, she's taking care of her kids, she's away from her children. It's all those things that, you know, Jackie had to go through. I'm not so worried about matching exactly what she did because we don't really know. And a lot of this project is filling in the blanks. She had this sort of movie star quality and and beyond. She's a wonderful actress, and she, I think she she was the absolutely perfect casting for Jackie. She brought a courage and a, a beauty to to her portrayal of Jackie that I don't I don't think we've ever seen before. And she looks a lot like her too. I don't think there's anybody who, when they first heard the idea, the notion of Katie playing Jackie, didn't go, oh. Oh, oh, you know, it's, it's, it's the quarter drops and you kind of have a sense that there's a fit there. And she, you know, was a woman that just worked very, very hard and made it look very effortless. And ultimately she did it to not only help her husband, but to help our country. And she really understood the power of, uh, you know, if he looked like a king and she looked like a queen, well, that our country looked amazing and, and still that's why we look back at this time period. Her relationship with Jack is something that we don't really know. You know, I think the positive thing about, about these two people is that they really did adore each other. And what I'm trying to portray is that intellectual match. And they were a powerful team and together when they were, you know, having hosting a dinner party or meeting people, they were they were on, they were, it was like they were putting on a play and they both knew it. Bobby was a very intense character and he was where he was during the administration and, and during the campaigns to 
protect his brother. When John Kassar and uh, Joel Cernow first called me and asked me to take on the role of RFK, I knew that it would be um, an incredible opportunity, but I also knew that it would be, you know, really big shoes to fill each day. Barry's really interesting because he he truly becomes that person. It's, it's actually a bit scary in a way, but he really has just come very prepared, uh, meticulous research. I find myself hearing Barry's voice all weekend after I work with him all week. I still hear that Barry voice. It's a little nasally, it's quick. He's just got it down, which was very exciting. Uh, and again, he just, he just wants it to be so right. Of course, then you're faced with this uh, daunting accent. It's so specific and Bobby in particular had a really unique vocal patterning. Everybody thought, you know, he's got mute. Was he listening to music? You know, he's not talking to anybody. But as it turns out, what he found was every recording that he could get his hands on from Bobby Kennedy. And he would just listen to it over and over and over, every day, every minute, to get all the nuances down, to pick up speech patterns. And, you know, it showed. I mean, literally up until he would speak the words on screen, roll camera, take the iPod out, and he'd, and he'd, and he'd speak the words of Bobby, and it was Incredible. What's been going on within the United States over the period of the last three years, the divisions, the violence, the disenchantment with our society, the divisions, whether it's between blacks and whites, between the poor and the more affluent, or between age groups or the war in Vietnam, is that we can start to work together. He spoke with so much passion and commitment, and that's where the emotion was coming from, and that's what affected his voice and affected his mannerisms uh, on, the, on the stage. And people said he was an awful public speaker, but I really think that he was one of the most genuine politicians that I've heard in, in probably the last 50 years. He went after the mob and, and, uh, and really you know, tore a hole in the fabric of uh, the underworld. It created a lot of enemies in, in Washington for him. I don't think he had any question that he would be killed but it didn't stop him. And there's great debate as to who he was as a man. And um, he was a deeply devoted father and a very devoted husband. And we really wanted to see that side of him, the family man and, and who he was outside of the political arena. The fascinating thing for me has been creating that authenticity between Ethel and Bobby. I mean, I didn't know Barry before we stepped on set to shoot our first scene together. It was quite fascinating how quickly we both settled into the couple aspect of Bobby and Ethel. He would be carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders and come home and she'd be like, you know, buck up and let's go. He just saw the world in, you know, very good versus evil terms. And I think he really got that from his mother, that moral righteousness. And he got his ruthlessness from Joe. When Joe Sr.'s ambitions uh, had been thwarted and were finished forever, he pushed his children into positions that, you know, they really sort of didn't want to be and no sense of perspective. There was the Kennedys and the rest, and the rest weren't worth anything. Our story really sits in the fact that Joe really was the push behind all of the Kennedy boys, and it was really his ambition that, uh, that pushed all of them to, to where they were, really pushed them into the presidency, all from a very young age. Now, if you boys don't remember anything else I say, remember this. It's not what you are, it's what people think you are. And with the right amount of money, you can make them think whatever you want. We're on our way, boys. This country is ours for the taking. <laughs> His worldview was kind of propped up by the triple stanchions of ambition, money, and family. And it's almost like medieval in its simplicity. You don't believe that God had a hand in all this? Oh, absolutely. Here is God's hand. My hand. <laughs> it's not to do with his intellect or anything like that. That's subjugated to this monster ego who had, you know, who sort of thought like the Borgias. You know, everyone else can go to hell except my family, which is going to the top. It's amazing that this man with all this ambition for himself and then for all his boys had to end up sort of, you know, in this wheelchair, a shell of a man, and all his boys, you know, had passed away. 
with Joe, there's very, very little of him on film. So that, in a way, is in my favor, that I, you know, that I, I'm playing somebody who nobody really knows, A, what they sounded like, and B, quite what they looked like. But although I didn't speak in my English accent, I gave him that sort of slightly kind of New England-y kind of feel to how he sounded like. I let the magic of the wardrobe and makeup sort of do the rest. These were the sort of defining characteristic of Joe Kennedy, these sort of round spectacles which he wore all his life, so you just kind of figure, well, if you put those on, you're home and dry. The men that we've married have great gifts and great flaws, but they are the men we've chosen. When you're asked to play somebody who is a real person, one of the issues that you have to address is whether you're going to attempt an impersonation or an interpretation. He gave you, a Catholic, the most important diplomatic post this country has to give. People will think you're ungrateful if you come out against him. You'll never be able to hold your head up again. I don't care what people think! I started off using much more my own voice range and then went higher as she got older. And then, of course, there's the famous Boston oh, Barbie, and arms, and charms, and father, which is difficult for an English ear because it sounds a bit as if you're doing too much, so... I had to embrace that and then keep checking and listen to her voice. He dedicated his life to you boys and this is what he gets for it. Can we talk about this a little later? There is nothing to talk about, Jack. Well, I, I don't... I never thought that I would say this. But I am very disappointed in you. She was a very, very powerful figure in the family. Those boys were a bit scared of her. Out of her nine children, Joe Kennedy Jr. has died, Jack has died, Bobby has died, her daughter Kathleen Kitt has died, Rosemary has been lobotomized, her husband Joe's had a stroke. This woman lived through almost gothic tragedy, one after another after another, and yet she has extraordinary composure. This is the woman of in indomitable spirit and in a certain sense the spirit of an era Cut. diana had the voice down she had the crackling voice down even just her body posture between the different you know eras she was able to do that and just brought a wonderful energy to the part and gave her the strength i mean rose was really quite strong she was the cornerstone of that family and and diana is just like that my feeling always is that it's much much easier to play leading roles because you get lots of goes and lots of chances to do lots of different things than it is to play the small role. Um, and the person who can play the small role and bring it to life is doing a marvellous job. That's what I tell young actors when they ask me. You just do it really well and be true and you'll be great. We're extremely fortunate to have the cast that we have. These are actors of such stature uh, that there will be, people will want to watch them. And I think what they've accomplished is uh, they have not done impressions of these characters. They have become these characters. And I think as, the, as this miniseries moves, moves on from episode to episode, uh, people will, will accept them as, as the Kennedys themselves because they've done such a terrific job. I was approached by Joel Cernow and his associates, Jonathan Kosh and Steve Michaels, to get on board and see if we could help produce this show as a Canadian production uh, using all the resources that are available to us here in Canada, as well as the international connections that we have. We wanted to work outside the studio system just for more creative autonomy and asylum myself and use all forged together it's sort of become the studio entity to produce the show. So, the goal, guys, is that we start like this, really claustrophobic, 
We have no idea where he is. And you'll see that there's a point where he kind of slides over. Okay. John is a terrific director in the sense that there is nobody more informed, uh, I think, than him, just in terms of uh, his research that he's done, in terms of his uh, knowing the accuracy of any particular scene that we find ourselves in. I mean, he's, he's, uh, he dove in quite deep in terms of um, every detail. He's got this 500-page script that he's got to, you know, have all of the pieces of the puzzle. He's juggling it all. And, you know, we're, we're kind of hyper-focused on our individual characters and, and their relationships with one another. But, you know, he's got the entire vision that he's bringing to the table every day. And yet, he was always uh, so happy and so much fun to, to work with. I think at some point you have to realize that you, you're not going to replicate history exactly the same. But we are going to make all the best efforts we can to do that. And, and, and we have, and we have in our production design, in our lighting, our wardrobe, and unbelievable attention to detail. We're not making a documentary, but what we do want to do to support all of the narrative and all of the textures of the period is to work back from the smallest detail up to the largest environment. We set, and action. Yes, Mr. Director. I have news for you. The president has been shot. Because the script is so strong, the characters are so strong, it's a real character piece, I think to do like an over, overly stylized uh, uh, type of work would, would take away from sort of the heart and soul of the story. So I've chosen kind of a naturalistic sort of a, approach. It's a very opulent family and, you know, lots of brass and chandeliers and crystal and, and that sort of thing, big wood environments of the, of the era. So I try to shoot sort of very uh, classic and, and draw the environments into the shooting and almost create the environment as another character. Jason, yes. he does a lot of leading on his left arm. His right hand left hand. Yeah, like that. Just do that. I just want to see what the furthest we can get. That's a tighter side. Like that. Yeah. Well, 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 somewhere there, I think that's good. We'll just start to feel through. Let's see where that, how that okay. lines up. Okay, that's great. There's a number of situations in which we're trying to recreate a very iconic uh, image. The Oval Office really stands out because that's where we have the biggest percentage of classic iconic photos that were in, you know, all the big magazines at the time, Time, Life, all those sort of things. And we work very hard to sort of create sort of matching angles and images to that. Again, I think it just puts our audience right in, into the story, you know, and it, it's, a, it's a good sell for kind of recreating a, a part of history, which is fascinating. Being here in Toronto with this super, super crew, just full of kind of admiration and, and gratitude for, for the niceness and competence and patience and expertise. I think Canada should be proud of them because they're brilliant. If I could take them with me on everything I did, I would. Mm-hmm. <laughs>
parallel couches. Unlike past presidents who would just, you know, take the formal chairs that usually occupied the periphery of the room, what he wanted to do was to say, you know what, I'm going to get the people I need to talk to with me. I'm going to work out what we need to in this room. Then, of course, there was the rocking chair. It was brought in as a comfortable, relief-giving chair for a president who had a chronically bad back. All of the property that you see here on, the, on the John's desk is um, faithfully and carefully reproduced from uh, recorded archival visual and uh, written information. I was fascinated to see that Jack Kennedy kept this. And what this is, is a reconstruction, a recreation of the coconut rind that Jack carved a message into when he was stranded on a remote island after having survived the crash of the PT-109. Some of these things are personal gifts, like the scrimshaw, which essentially is a shark's tooth. And it's, it has to do with his life of sailing and, you know, being related to the ocean. A monogrammed lighter, something that he was also very fond of. The uh, cannon bookends, which appear, you know, in a couple of offices that he held. The blotter set was a gift from the French government, and particularly their emerging relationship with de Gaulle. So this is finished in very fine um, alligator with um, you know burnished brass details. He kept a number of books on his desk, the books that really affected him as he went through his university years, as well as a book that Jack edited, which was a series of real life stories about the soldiers in the Second World War. And it's dedicated uh, to his deceased brother. You know, we recreate even mundane things like the, you know, uh, congressional directory. That's something the president would have been given. So welcome to our Hyannis port set. Uh, so what we've done here is we've built a fragment of the main house, the iconic main house, which is, you know, a classic New England Cape house that sits, you know, with a relationship to the water. There was a lot of discussions early on about how much of Hyannisport, which is a big house, uh, we were going to build. It's such a distinctive building that we couldn't find anything. So were we going to build the entire front, which is a couple hundred feet across? That's a big build. Uh, what we decided to do was actually to just build the front porch where everyone hangs out a little bit to the side with the driveway. And when we go wider in these shots, then what you'll see is a CGI house that'll match our set piece perfectly. The visual effects that we're doing are what I call hidden effects. And actually, if we're doing our job, you don't see them. Everything has to play as 100% real. And if you can tell if it's a visual effect, then we're not doing our job. The essential ingredients were finding a place that allowed us to bring a car in to the corner of the house to have this expansive lawn for famous football games and the relationship to the water. So we had the beachfront as well. One of the famous things documented for the Kennedys is the, the circle at the end of the drive. There's so many photographs taken and a little movie shot of all of the children in the Kennedy clan running out to embrace, you know, either Jack or Bobby, whoever was coming home. In our story, we see some of the uh, picture vehicles there because we have different people arriving for different scenes. Very much this was a house and a home made by Rose Kennedy. So a lot of the uh, decor and detail touches are very much inspired by her character. Perhaps even more than the White House story, the Hyannisport, you know, represents the, the real family legacy of the Kennedys. I will uphold the traditions of my state, and I will honor the history of this fine university. Americans are free, in short, to disagree with the law, 
but not to disobey it. We chose to tell the Ole Miss story because it was the one explosive moment for the administration as far as the civil rights issue was concerned. And so we felt that it was just on its own merits, the most dramatic story along those lines we could tell. There are plenty of Negro schools down there. Are you sure you wouldn't be more comfortable with your own kind? Sir, I'm a citizen of Mississippi. I am of my own kind. Jack also had to deal with the political ramifications. It's how do I accomplish what I want to see happen, which is Meredith get in, without A, wholesale bloodshed, and B, losing my political support that I desperately need to have. He did it, and there was violence, there were deaths, but it could have been a lot worse. We're in a very good place as to what the location looks like, what the people are gonna look like. We're really good at that, but I need to concentrate on what the feeling was like, what, what those people were feeling. You know, what this kid, you know, in, in face of all that racism was doing, standing there, insisting to get into this school. So that's really what I wanted to get. Action, okay, quietly, action. Good, hands up, that looks fantastic. And listen to this! The, the actual event spanned many days, and to some degree, for dramatic purposes, we're foreshortening that into a few scenes. So I know a number of the details are going to be crushed together and commingled when they would have been quite separated and, uh, and you know, fragmented over a larger period of time. But that's just kind of the way it works, telling these stories. When you have uh, mobs of hundreds of people, you know, they come with crowbars and metal objects and, and they'll pry a car apart. This is this scene here, this car here is pretty well matches what it looked like an old mess, what they did. Normally when we're doing car racks, burnt out vehicles, we purchase the vehicle. I've rented this. It's a rental. And we're gonna give, I'm gonna give it back to him as a rental, and we'll use it again in future projects as a burnt out vehicle. And that was the deal. Behind me is a 1957 Cadillac limousine. It's used in the scenes with Jack Kennedy, to and from Hyannisport, uh, the voting. This car's value is close to ninety to $100,000, a very rare car. Alvis was a collector of cars. The gentleman who purchased this car off the press of the estate bought this in 77. Joseph Kennedy Sr. bought the exact same car for Jack Kennedy back in 1957, and he used this car up until the assassination. The Kenny family owned several different vehicles. Joe Sr. liked his roles. And in this movie, we have three roles. The other vehicle that we have that the Kennys own is a 59 Lincoln Continental four-door, Bobby Kennedy. He used it as their family sedan. Like nowadays, we would use our minivans. Guys like me, when we bring the cars on set, we really look after them. And I always make sure that the owners of the vehicles are with their cars. They're within an eye shot away of the cars because they're the ones who have the time and investment into it. And they're happy to be with us. They want to see how the movie is made, and they're very excited. There's a correlation of us that make this all happen. And we have to make it authentic, and we have to make them believable. And that's part of doing this business. Not only do they have to look good, but they have to run properly. And that's the biggest challenge when you're doing a period piece. This family is the most watched family in the history of the world. So for my job, the pressure's on to make a match. This project is a very large, expansive project covering many decades, uh, all of which I'm, and any costume designer I would imagine is very interested in. The leads approximately had 
between 45 and 50 costumes apiece, so that would be 300 for Jack through to Bobby, Ethel, Rose, Joe, and Jackie. And then the background, probably we dressed another 3,000 people. When Jack was elected president, Jackie was aware that she needed uh, to wear American-made clothing, and so she collaborated with uh, Oleg Cassini, who was already a well-known designer. The gowns were always very streamlined. Um, often the bodice and the skirt were very similar shape. Uh, they would uh, change the colors or add a, a bow or a simple detail. The actual construction of such a simple garment has to be perfect. The lines have to be perfect in order for it to fall properly and to look good on the individual. Katie had certain things that she really, really was attracted to, and so she's always been very, very receptive and positive with all the things that we've presented her. Everything that we've constructed for her has been made according to documented photographic evidence. This is the inauguration coat. Jackie stood out in this garment because most of the women wore fur or very heavy looking dark garments and she was wearing this beautiful cream cashmere coat and hat um, with a um, sable collar. She's known for the pillbox hat which was her signature. At the time, people often wore their hats right on the top of their head, but her style was to wear it further back. We built many of the suits for Jack, Bobby, and Joe Sr. There's a specific style in the Kennedy family as well that uh, they wore single cuffs with a cuff link as opposed to a double turn cuff. They all wore tie bars and watches, standard things for men in business. Bobby was, someone described him, I think, at one point as being scruffy but preppy. Sometimes you see pictures of him where his cuffs are hanging down or he's got his tie poked into his shirt to get it out of the way. He was very driven, I believe, and he probably didn't even really pay much attention to his clothes. This is the inauguration um, gown. that Lorene has made for me. It's a very fabulous bit of schmutter. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Much better than the original. So, should we go and yes, get this on? Yes, let's try. For an actor, the most important thing is to put the clothes on and forget about them. Mm. So if you're constantly, you know, pulling and hitching and worrying about whether you look fat or thin or, you know, whatever, you can't really do the job properly, which is to just act. It's really. a marriage of the, of the character and the actor and they do come together somewhere in the middle and it's uh, always a miraculous transformation. This is the Marilyn Monroe Happy Birthday Mr. President dress that she appeared in Madison Square Gardens in 1962 for the President's birthday in May. And um, it was a, a sensation at the time because it was almost like an invisible kind of dress that was completely covered in sparkling stones. You know, they call you in, and there's like a couple like pieces of silk, and they sew you in. And then the next time you come in, there's an added fabric. And then the next time you come in, there's beads all over the place. And so I believe there are like almost over 8,000 crystals on here, which is <laughs> The dress is uh, meant to be very fitted and tight around the knees. Marilyn had to shuffle in it. It did have a bit of a, a fluting at the back. So we've, we've reproduced that, and, um, but she'll have to walk small steps in this dress, definitely. I can't sit, I can't really do much of anything. So for the entire day, I will be leaning <laughs> on something to sort of catch my balance and hopefully my breath, but all the clothes have been to die for. I really feel like with not just the wardrobe, but with everybody on the set, you're working with the best of the best, like the wardrobe people and the hair and the makeup, and they're transforming all of us. And that's pretty rad. Turning Charlotte into Marilyn was, was fundamentally pretty easy because Charlotte's a beautiful woman to begin with, and she has that sort of natural, sort of country girl beauty about her to begin with, which Marilyn had as well. Marilyn Monroe was such a contrived makeup. She really was a formula. So it was really a matter of just copying that formula and, uh, and making sure that all of those elements and all of those components were present in Charlotte's face. And, and, and that's how we ended up with that look. The main objective 
in designing the makeups for this. We were trying more to design a look that when the audience is watching this, they'll say, I never noticed how much Katie Holmes looks like Jackie Kennedy, or I never noticed how much Barry looks like Bobby, rather than trying to make them look like identical lookalikes. It's just, it would never happen. It would be, uh, it's too complicated. They don't look like them enough to begin with and we'd lose the actors underneath all of the makeup if we chose to go in that direction. It's really important uh, to, to, to have that mask because it really allows you to just to, total freedom to explore and create and, and not feel vulnerable or, or uh, self-conscious. And these guys are just absolutely legendary, iconoclastic you know, figures in our history. And, and so it, it gets, it's easy to get under your skin. It was really exciting for me because it was kind of like, you know, putting on the armor for battle. Barry's makeup is a combination of four things. It's a combination of a silicone nose that we apply every day. Um, Christian Tinsley made a beautiful nose for me. He's got dentures as well. Bobby had a very specific look to his teeth. Actually, all the Kennedys did for that matter. And uh, blue contact lenses that we use on him. The fourth element of Barry's makeup is the essence of uh, changing somebody's face with contour and highlighting. In the Katie Holmes makeup, the, the Jackie makeup, um, one of the things that really stood out to me when I looked at Jackie's, uh, the photos of Jackie that we had in our research was Jackie had very, very wide set eyes. Katie's got basically a, the perfect structure to her face. Everything's exactly where it ought to be for, for a perfect beauty makeup. Um, but that's not really what Jackie was. So I had to try to uh, restructure Katie's face and then once that was achieved, then the makeup was applied as if that was the structure of her face to begin with. Diana and Tom's makeup, were they were probably the most complicated makeups that we did. Through a series of wigs and uh, bald caps and aging techniques, we took Tom from a fairly early age in the story to uh, into his 80s after Joe had Sr. had had his stroke. The challenge of working on a project like this is, is number one, it's a period project. So we've got to accurately represent the periods as we move through them. We kept the essence of who they really are and tried to sort of infuse the essence of who they're trying to portray. I think anybody who has ever had uh, father issues or mother issues can relate to some of the things that these people went through that, that they would have gone through whether they had been accountants or or lawyers or anything, but uh, you know, you don't think of it as President of the United States having to worry about what Dad thinks, and yet that was a very strong component of what he had to go through. There are people who have an image of the Kennedys that they don't want tampered with. We didn't set out to tamper with the image, we set out to tell the story. They were people who lived to the highest level of energy and of accomplishment and they lived in a fishbowl. And I think that whatever challenges they had tended to become very, very public, or the making sure that they didn't become public. The interesting thing for me is we're trying to dig in and, and try to discover what it was like for two brothers just being brothers and, and helping each other's helping each other make decisions. That's really where we dig in. You know, what, what's it like to be a husband, you know, talking to your wife about having the weight of the world and truly the weight of the world on your shoulders? Obviously, there are certain things that you just simply can't know. Jack and Jackie talking in the privacy of their own, own room is not a matter of the historical record, but what happened in the cabinet room and in the Oval Office and the decisions that were made at the Bay of Pigs or the Berlin Wall or the Cuban Missile Crisis, these are things that can be supported. We had to compress time frames, we had to limit the number of personalities that were shown, and we had to keep the storyline flowing uh, in a way that an audience could understand it in eight hours. We decided this was going to be historically accurate in, in a plausible way to the best of our ability to do it. And that's why we went about it the way that we did and why we paid as much attention to detail. And we took every measure possible, historians, you now vetting it ourselves, multiple sources. We went through an entire process that um, I don't think anybody's ever gone through in trying to do historical fiction in the way that we've done it. I think after watching this series, I believe people will have a much broader understanding of, of who they were. Boys, come on, come on over here. You. Uh, take a photograph of this. One day it may be worth something. <laughs>